Welcome! The Farmhouse Museum on Iowa State University's campus brings you this virtual program, Which Fork Do I Use? The Emily Post Institute on Children's Etiquette, in conjunction with the current exhibition, Growing Up Victorian. Great-great-grandson of author, advocate, and etiquette professional Emily Post, our program presenter tonight is Daniel Post Senning. He is co-author of the 19th edition of Emily Post's Etiquette and will present this program on changes in teaching children manners from the Victorian era to today. This pre-recorded virtual program will be posted on University Museum's YouTube channel through November 2nd. The two Emily Post Institute programs this semester are generously supported by Dr. Chad E. Harris, a BA from Iowa State in 01. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hello. My name is Daniel Post Senning, and I am an author and spokesperson for the Emily Post Institute, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. The topic for today's talk is dining etiquette, and more specifically, how we teach dining etiquette to children. So in order to do that, in service of that idea, I want to do a review of contemporary dining etiquette. But the broader context for today's talk is looking at how dining etiquette connects to the Victorian era and how we taught children dining etiquette in the Victorian era and maybe how that etiquette has changed but also how that teaching process has changed over time since that the Victorian period all the way through the modern era and what I'm going to be referring to today is the contemporary time or today. Now as I mentioned, we're going to we're going to look a little bit at Emily Post's life and then we're going to make a transition. We're going to get really into the, the nitty gritty, the details of dining etiquette. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to be working from a slide deck and I want to start by sharing that with you. And I always like to start a talk by also sharing an agenda. And I think it's really important that we all have some idea of how we're going to spend our time together. So as I mentioned, we're going to start by talking about Emily Post as a historical figure, but I'm hoping to provide a, a more personal view of her, her personality, who she was as a young woman, who she was as an adult, and how her legacy has been stewarded since her time. We're then going to transition. We're going to talk about dining etiquette essentials, things like the table setting, utensils, manners for specific courses, and some specific and particular etiquettes for the end of the meal. There will then be a, a, a very brief 10-point bulleted review. These top dining takeaways and um, hopefully that'll be a resource that'll be a good refresher and also a reminder for everyone moving forward, both children and parents alike. Um, so without further ado, please allow me to introduce Emily Post. Emily Post was my great, great grandmother. The Emily Post Institute is a five generation family business. Emily wrote her first book of etiquette in 1922, almost exactly 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago. The centennial edition of her etiquette book was published in 2022. That book had gone through 20 editions in its lifetime. But there was more to Emily Post than just Emily Post, the author. She was also a Eleanor Roosevelt, the honor of that. that Emily Post operated. And um, it's a little bit difficult for people today to fully understand the type of celebrity that could be achieved as an author. Maybe J.K. Rowling is one of the, the sort of contemporary examples that might give some sense for the kind of notoriety that she achieved through her writing, the type of popular appeal that she had. She was the arbiter of social standards and conduct in America from the time that she published Etiquette till the end of her life and was really a remarkable woman. But I want to start the story since we're talking about the Victorian era, children teaching etiquette to children with Emily Post Childhood. I'd like to start with her youth, which was very firmly planted in that late Victorian era. She was born in 1872 to her parents, Bruce and Josephine. Bruce Price was her father. Her mother was born Josephine Lee, took her husband's name when they were married. They lived primarily in Emily's early life in Baltimore, but they moved to New York where they spent time in Emily's childhood between both Tuxedo Park and Bar Harbor, Maine. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. 
in the pictures that you see in front of you, you see Emily with Josephine, her mother, and also in a family portrait, very Victorian in its composition and um, look and feel. But it's really the relationship with her father, Bruce Price, that I wanna emphasize and focus, particularly as it relates to her as a child. There's no question that her mother was an indefatigable woman, uh, uh, a hard charging and um, a uh, very careful planner, very competent businesswoman. And Emily learned a lot from her mother. There's no question that the way she conducted herself as a career woman later in life was something that she um, had definitely learned and, and, and required personality traits that she had um, learned probably from her mother. But in her childhood, it was her father who she doted on and who doted on her. She was a daddy's girl. They were incredibly close. Now, Bruce Price was a, a man of some note in his own regard. He was an American architect who moved his practice from Baltimore to New York. When he arrived in New York, the first major commission that he received was for a planned residential development called Tuxedo Park. There was a tobacco baron named Pierre Lolliard who owned a very large property outside New York City. And it was the, the land and the hills around a large lake, the uh, apocryphally, the name of the lake was Pawtuxedo in Native American language. And that word was contracted and people referred to the lake and the area around it as Tuxedo and Tuxedo Park. So this is a picture of the social club at Tuxedo Park. And the idea behind the development of Tuxedo Park is that there would be planned um, homes, cottages that were in and around the lake that would allow occupants to escape from the city in the hot summer months without going as far as Bar Harbor or to the coast. They could stay nearby, but also be in a green space where they could fish. If they like to hunt, they could hunt, but they could exercise, be outdoors, have fresh air, and live in their cottages, six and seven bedroom homes that were also designed by Bruce Price. And it was a very successful development. And a lot of New York's high society ended up living there. Emily's father received a couple houses there as a commission for his work. So Emily grew up in a house in Tuxedo Park and later was given a house in Tuxedo as a wedding present by her father and spent her early married life there as well. Emily was from a working family. Her father was an architect who worked to support himself and his family. She was not uh, a, an owner of a large amount of capital. She wasn't the 1% of the 1% of her day, but she had exposure to that world. She had exposure to that world through her father and through the social club and through her connections and relationships at Tuxedo Park. It was a world that she was intimately familiar with. So now I want to talk a little bit about some sartorial history. A little chicken or egg question for you. I'm curious if anyone out there watching this right now knows already what came first, the tuxedo or tuxedo park? Because I've talked about the origin of the name, you're probably guessing the tuxedo park came first. So how did we end up with a garment called tuxedo and are the two related? They absolutely are. So the King of England at the time, I believe he was a Henry would invite Americans who were visiting him for dinner to come to dinner informally. He would say, you don't need to get dressed in your full tails. Every time you come out to eat with me, if we're in the castle, you can wear a regular jacket, a regular dinner jacket, a tailless coat. And he would send them to his tailor to get one made because usually they weren't prepared for that type of dress or that type of occasion. When those same Americans adopted the same fashion back in the States, when they went to the social club at they didn't get fully dressed for dinner, when they wore a short jacket or a tailless dinner jacket, people started to refer to it as a tuxedo jacket, a jacket like the men from Tuxedo would wear. The first mention of it as a garment named as such was in the New York Times after a ball that had happened at the social club at Tuxedo when Pierre's son had worn that jacket out to the, the ball that evening. I think it is really, um, it's fun to know the origin of the Tuxedo, but it's also really illustrative about etiquette. The What was once an informal option when you didn't want to get fully dressed for dinner is now Consider one of the most formal garments that we have. America's great contribution to global formal wear, the most formal outfit that many people will put on in their entire lives, started off as an informal option when you didn't want to get dressed for dinner. What a, what a vivid reminder of what a moving target etiquette can be and how the standards of one time 
both in form and shape, standards from another time, but are also different, how they're related, but also how they evolve. And I think this is something that's really important to keep in mind as we think about dining etiquette in particular and methods for teaching dining etiquette to children. Some other signature projects, very recognizable buildings that Bruce Price was responsible for, the American Surety Building. It's on the uh, the lower tip of Manhattan on the corners of Wall Street and Pine. If you've ever been down there, visited the Trinity Church, or or if you are planning to go and the Trinity Church is on your list, if you're standing looking at the Trinity Church and you turn around, the building that you're now facing is the American Surety Building. They've since stacked more stories on top, but the lobby is a historic landmark. It will never be changed. And the facade for the first 11 or 12 stories of the building remains as it was when it was originally designed. So this wasn't the one of the tallest buildings in the world. This was at a time when people were building buildings taller and taller all the time, but it was definitely an early tall building in lower Manhattan. Probably the most recognizable project that Bruce Price was responsible for was the Chateau Frontenac. It dominates the skyline of the city of Quebec to this day and is an absolute fixture of that city. It was part of a series of hotels that were commissioned by the Canadian Railroad. This was really the crown jewel. Um, and it's just a stunning building. You can still go to the Chateau Frontenac today and take a tour from someone who is um, dressed and uh, playing the character of Emily Post. I mention this because Emily was by her father's side. She didn't have a, a formal education in the way that we think of it today, a formal academic education, but she was incredibly fortunate in that she had access to her father's world. There is no question in my mind that if she had been a boy at the time, if she'd grown up to be a man, that she would have pursued and followed her father's footsteps into a career in architecture. That wasn't such a common path for people at the time that um, that Emily was living in the 1800s, the very um, beginning of the 20th century when she would have been making these decisions. Now, I do think that Emily applied her intellectual inheritance from her father, who had an incredible sense of proportionality and right use, a man who designed buildings both for the spaces they occupied and the functions that their occupants required of them, to her area of agency the social sphere. Emily was a social architect and she was um, incredibly adept at identifying the systems and structures that supported the human relationships that, that operated all around her. And really the, the, the navigating of those relationships was in many ways seen as, as her job and her role at the time. Let me uh, present to you Emily Post as she was presented to society in 1891. And this was her coming out, and by all accounts, it was very successful. She was identified as one of the, the, the great catches of the season, one of the, the women who captured the eye and attention of New York society. She was married to Edward Main Post within, uh, well, engaged within a year and, and actually married within two years of her, of her coming out. They had two sons relatively early in their marriage. And it wasn't until 1905 that her life really took an unexpected turn and she herself divorced. Now, this was not unheard of. She wasn't the first woman in New York society to get divorced, but it was definitely early on. It was uncommon. The, the slightly longer story is that her husband got caught in a scandalous affair. He was being extorted by a kind of tabloid that would uh, threaten to expose illicit extramarital affairs if you didn't buy subscriptions to their publication. If you've ever heard someone called or been called a tattletale, Tattler's Tales was one of these yellow journalism rags that would tell stories about high society. Not all of these um, publications were so ethical. And some would try to extort money from people. In fact, a, a great number of people in New York society had been exposed to this kind of extortion. The post refused to pay the bribe. They talked to the police. Police hid in a closet. There was a sting and people were arrested. The, the extortion ring was exposed and shut down. And Edwin was applauded on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange by a group of men who had probably faced very similar um, extortion threats and, and probably had paid them themselves. And while he received a claim for that, that principled stand, 
his wife was was asked to bear the brunt of the social shame. And when the scandal was over, when it had died down, she asked for a divorce. Now, Emily had started writing in the last year of her marriage. She wrote a romance novel called The Flight of a Moth about a young woman uh, uh, emerging from her cocoon and flying free. Not quite a butterfly, this time it was a moth. You can uh, sort of get the allegory yourself and apply it to her own life. She continued writing after her divorce. In fact, she was a working woman, a career woman who wrote to support herself and her children. She was land rich, but cash poor. Um, she wrote about what she knew. Uh, Woven in the Tapestry was a book with sort of a mystical theme to it. The title market was about uh, daughters of American industrial wealth traveling Europe, marrying titles. So it was a, a, a romance style, a, a romance novel about Americans traveling in Europe and falling in love. Not great literature, good reads, um, great for Emily Postophiles if you're curious about it, but um, she really started to make her mark when she transitioned to nonfiction. And her first work of nonfiction was a book that I love telling people about. It's called By Motor to the Golden Gate. It was written in 1916 about a cross country road trip. She took in a custom Mercedes touring car from New York City to San Francisco. Now, there were very few paved roads west of the Mississippi River at this time. It was a, a genuine adventure. She wasn't the first person to do a cross-country road trip. There were uh, a couple of men who competed for that honor. Edsel Ford was one of them. They left in 1914. Whether you count their total time, first, you could say different people did it first, but she's definitely the first person that I know of that wrote about her cross-country road trip. She chronicled a cross-country road trip. I get to say the name Emily Post and Jack Kerouac in the same sentence because she's part of a great American literary tradition of adventure and exploration and also um, a, a, a willingness and an interest to write and about those experiences and share them. So she wrote a series of articles that were mailed home and published and were later compiled together into a book. It's where she really began her work as a cultural or social anthropologist, where she got um, outside of New York society and started to learn lessons both about the different ways that people live, but also how you talked about them in ways that let people hear. Some of the early tone from her writing on that trip involves sort of surprise or um, maybe even a just, just a hint of, of snobbery, of that looking down your nose at something. But uh, those weren't well received. And very quickly, she learned to adopt a much more generous perspective, a much more investigative approach to um, uh, learning about and describing all of the different cultures that she discovered and explored along the way. Now, when she returned to New York, she was approached by an editor who was interested in her writing a type of book that was very popular at the time. America was going through a lot of social change very rapidly. This is now the end of the Victorian era. We're talking about a time of rapid uh, industrialization and also a lot of immigration, both from other countries to America, but more specifically from rural communities to cities. And people were looking for common social codes, ways to um, identify themselves and each other, how to conduct themselves in a society that was um, increasingly diverse, increasingly complex, and was uh, using fewer and fewer of the very strong class identifiers that had so marked the Victorian era. Well, Emily didn't have much interest in this kind of book. She told her friend, Mr. Crown and Field, tell him I'll write a, a book about etiquette. It's a sensible book, a little book. I haven't got much to say. The whole topic can be reduced to a few basic principles. He persisted, she relented and came back with this idea that, that this is a pretty simple topic and there might not be a lot to say about it. Well, she turned in a manuscript over 400 pages that has been in print ever since. It became known as the Blue Book of Social Usage and it was a smash hit. It was an instant overnight success. They literally, and I'm using that term correctly because this is a, a, a literal reference, they literally could not print it fast enough. It went through eight printings in its first six months, and it went through 10 editions in her lifetime. She ended up founding the Emily Post Institute with her son, Ned, to continue the updating and publication of etiquette after she was gone. As I mentioned already, it's it's really hard to describe what a... What a 
instant celebrity Emily Post became and how she became the arbiter, the standard for American manners and America's go-to source for both instruction, but also advice. Her newspaper column was a Q&A column. It was syndicated across the country and she had multiple radio shows that operated with a similar format. People would submit questions and Emily would answer them and the audience would hang on every word. At the time, the idea of mass communication was a new thing and Emily was enamored of it. I'm gonna share with you some home videos of Emily a little bit later. They're silent videos. I'm gonna be doing a reading over them, but keep your eye open. There's a point where she's taking out maps and showing people maps and radios in her house. She had a radio in every room and she was fascinated at the coverage area that different radio stations had. So if she knew she was playing on this radio station, she would know where the antennas were and she would move which areas of which cities fell under the, the listenership of those stations. She was um, really fascinated and curious about this new type of communication, this, this mass communication that radio provided. Um, ultimately, she retired to a small co cottage in Martha's Vineyard. She didn't end up back in Bar Harbor, Maine. She chose Edgar Town in Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. She worked on the cottage throughout her life. It became her architectural project and she developed it over time. She took special care with the garden, which remains a spot on tours of Edgartown to this day. It is a remarkable spot. It is um, definitely well worth it if you find yourself in the area. The interior of the house is a good example of the type of writing that she employed in the personality of a house, which was all about interior design. Again, this was a sort of a return to her architectural roots, but in her area of agency, her thinking about how people operated and lived and inhabited spaces and how those spaces supported the kind of lives that we wanted to live and also made people feel comfortable and gave them a sense of ease and being at home. I really like to mention this because I think it's a, a signature attribute of Emily's, how much she thought about the home space, both in terms of our interactions and relationships with each other, but also in terms of the spaces that we lived in. So how we create the lives that we want to live was a, a topic that Emily found really interesting. Now, this is a picture of Emily, how I think many more people most likely picture her, a matronly figure who took care with the people around her and offered and imparted wisdom that often comes with age. And it's certainly true that after writing and thinking and speaking about etiquette and representing it nationally for many, many, many years, Emily um, developed a, the ability to really turn a phrase. She could talk about these things and describe them in ways that were very effective. But that clarity of vision that she approached to write a book about etiquette, the idea that it could all be reduced to a few simple principles, I think is really important. And I think it, it, served her well over a long career. And we can see it still in the way she talked about etiquette at this time in her life. She said, whenever two people come together and their behavior affects one another, you have etiquette. Etiquette is not some rigid code of manners. It's simply how persons' lives touch one another. There is a very human perspective here. This is someone who while immersed in the architecture of our social lives, all of the, the rules and social codes and expectations that allow us to function as communities and civil societies. But at the same time, she never lost heart of the very human, that very direct connection that um, is just so important and really is the beating heart of good etiquette without which um, all of those other uh, rules and systems are cold and, and don't function well. And if you think about the ways that uh, Victorian era children and children's discipline are thought of, that it was a very structured world. We were not supposed to show affection to children. Uh, providing a disciplined environment was really considered the the key to providing children with the tools that they would need to be both successful but also functional and happy adults and i think this is an impression that that, that often creates a sense of coldness and i don't think that that is entirely true in fact I, I in thinking about emily and her close relationship with her father wanted to share with you a couple readings from a book that emily published you probably saw it on the list of nonfiction in 1940 called children are people and this is the book that Emily wrote for parents and teachers about teaching etiquette to children. And 
I want to offer you what she wrote, just the first two paragraphs of the opening chapter, which is titled You and Your Child Together. She begins, we are all inclined to think of exceptionally lovable and charming children as having been just born like that. And it is true, of course, that inherited qualities, when excellent, are the highest of assets. But the particular traits, which, taken together, produce a completely enchanting child, are nine times out of ten the result of enchanting training. The typical confidences and reticences of a little child are suggestive of the surf breaking on the shore. They start coming toward you gently, quite far away, gather momentum, and then hurry forward on the crest of a high, curling wave of delight or surprise or wonder or teasing, and then suddenly draw out and are covered up and gone. Plainly then, training that is to entice the confidence of such a child is not to be practiced by means of orders, shouted down by one in authority at a small person that he must not do this and he must do that. The training that produces an enchanting child is an adventure embarked upon with a comrade who walks a comrade who smiling says, come, let's do this, or let's go there together. I, I just love it. I love the idea that you are a companion, that you are with your child. You are not just the authority in their life. And I think that we can feel that very human approach in the way that Emily approached etiquette. And I also just wanted to share that as a as something that's not only in her writing, but also something that, that I feel is part of the legacy that she handed down through her family. So Emily started the Institute with her surviving son, Ned, or Edwin Post. Her other son, Bruce, died of appendicitis at age 31. Early on in his architectural career, it was one of the great sadnesses of Emily's life. But Edwin also had a son. His son was William or Bill Post. I knew him as Poppy. And he married Elizabeth Post, and she was the, the steward of the tradition. She wrote as Emily Post while I, I was growing up. I called the mud and poppy. And people have asked me, was it ever awkward growing up in the Post family as a child? Did you ever feel nervous or ill at ease or, or um, scared about, about expectations in the Post family? And I always think of my grandparents and I say, absolutely not. In fact, exactly the opposite. I loved visiting my grandparents. They were the warmest, kindest, most gentle, gentle people I ever knew and had the good fortune to spend time with. And as I started to work for the Emily Post Institute, I started to think about children. And, and I started to think about my friends coming with me to meet my grandparents. And I think maybe some of them might've felt a little bit of that nervousness that people wondered if I ever felt, but. I never felt it. I didn't even think about it until I was an adult because I didn't have any fear that it would be difficult or awkward or hard for my friends to meet my grandparents. In fact, I knew just the opposite. I knew that my grandparents would make them feel comfortable at ease and welcome. Now, the fourth generation of the family also took their turn at the helm. My uncles Peter and Aunt Peggy and mother Cindy Posenning all continued the updating of the book etiquette added titles on business wedding and children's etiquette. And now the fifth generation of the Post family steward the tradition. Lizzie Post and I co-author books currently and our principals at the Institute. Anna Post was an excellent presenter who did a lot of work with the Institute as well. Now, one of the real unique and special perspectives that being part of a five generation family business writing about etiquette has provided is a sense for how etiquette changes and evolves over time. But in relation to that, direct relation to that is also a sense for what is incredibly durable about etiquette, what it is about etiquette that makes it last. And definitely dining etiquette is the material that looks the most similar in the centennial edition of etiquette and the original edition of Etiquette published in 1928. As we think about durability of that etiquette, I think it makes a lot of sense. The heart of good etiquette is often practicality. And for as long as forks have been produced that look like the forks we're familiar with today, they've been produced to be held in the hand in a certain way. A knife has always been an implement that has a sharp edge that you needed to take care with and have control over. So how you use and hold a knife is something that people have practiced and thought about and done many, 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 many times for many, 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 many years. And the likelihood that 
that you will reinvent this process in a, a revolutionary new way is not likely. These are some of the most durable manners within a particular culinary tradition or uh, within a cuisine, table manners stay remarkably consistent over time. Now, the origin of the table manners that are described in Emily Post etiquette really come from that Victorian era. And in thinking about the ways that we generationally transfer um, information and also how particularly this information that's so durable was transferred between the Victorian era and the early modern era that followed, remember Emily wrote in 22, between the two world wars, really parallels in many ways a lot of the challenges that we're facing today, 100 years later, as we leave what many people call the modern era and into something that is more contemporary or even unnamed yet. We don't know exactly what we're calling this era of technological innovation and infinite connectivity that we're all um, living in now, but really emerging into as a society. And I wanted to share with you while some Emily Post home videos play, uh, the introduction to the Children Are People book. And what you're going to see is Emily with her grown son and her child grandson playing at the beach. So they're going to return home. I've included a little bit of early footage, some of the only footage we have of Emily Post actually eating herself. And then at the end, you're going to see Emily playing at her house in Martha's Vineyard with her great grandchildren, sort of firmly in the the, the 1960s, when um, the 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 modern era is really sort of firmly happening and maybe even starting to wane. But we can see a plastic ball. We can see the future coming as well. Emily begins Children Are People with this broad idea. For a long time, I have listened without protest to the opinions of certain moderns who have convinced themselves that the home training of yesterday was all wrong and that the parents of today have alone laid out the course that is right. But I never did think so. It is frankly my opinion that the encouragement of unrestrained self-expression has gone too far and that what parents and children of the present day really need is a return to the sanity and simplicity of the home life. Obviously, homes are not, were not all like yesterday, any more than they are today. There may have been many over-exacting parents who commanded, do as I say, because I say so, but those of today who declare that the typical mothers and fathers of yesterday were not companions, in the very complete meaning of the word, must have memories very different from my own. Even granting that my picture of yesterday is somewhat over beautified by sentiment, there are plenty of definite facts to substantiate my belief that in comparing the typical home companionship of yesterday with that which is typical today, the advantages of yesterday were far greater. Against a certain number of mothers and fathers who yesterday intolerantly exacted conformity from their children without question or criticism to the pattern set for them, are those of today who apparently care very little about what patterns their children may be copying. Countless parents, in fact, seem to have time for everything else in the world except for their children. And my picture of today is not merely taken from one small personal view. It is a composite of thousands of views shown to me in letters from men as well as women, from boys as well as girls, readers of all ages and from all sections of the country. At the present moment, there are signs of nostalgia, even from the youngest, for something more stable, more spiritually satisfying than license and vulgarity, label freedom, and frankness. Time and again lately, I have been asked to describe the development of a charm not as a result of practice postures, but as the outward expression of an inward grace. Over and over again, I've been urged to emphasize the word gentle, gentle people, gentle living. And in between the lines of letter after letter, I have found the same evidence of longing for the beauty of what home should mean. The suggestions are scarcely simple ones to follow of what is the essence of charm, of what is the spirit of home, of what is the beauty of living. To imagine, for example, that the intangible qualities of charm could ever be acquired by means of consciously assumed facial expressions is much the same as imagining that living flowers could be made from silk or muslin with the help of paint and wire and glue. And yet it is quite true that the development of charm, as well as many other not to be imitated qualities of personality and of taste, comes into the subject of this book, exactly as perfume comes into the subject of flower growing. 
If we plant violets, roses, heliotrope, lilies, jasmine, perfume will grow increasingly sweet. For some of us, too sweet. If we plant delphiniums, gladioli, dahlias, and so on, we shall have gorgeous color. But certainly we cannot put perfumes on with atomizers or color with a paintbrush. Plainly then, this book is to be somewhat like a book on gardening and that it describes similar processes of cultivation without which all young seedlings naturally die. And yet it can happen, as we all know, that on occasion flower seeds blow by the wind and fall babies with cradles or any of the tender care that a cradle implies have by means of their God-given force grown to perfect maturity. But as a usual thing, the flowers watched over by a skilled gardener and the children watched over by skilled parents have far greater perfection. This question of skill has an indefinite meaning. Although it is usually the result of long practice in addition to training, there are occasional gardeners and parents whose natural neck, as we usually call it, produces perfect results. But just as flowers bloom for those who wisely understand and patiently supply their needs, so too this wise understanding, known by the name of comradeship, bring to full flower the heart and mind of a child. I just love this very human approach. I see Emily balancing ideas of the importance of tradition and structure, but also ideas about freedom and exploration. And she mirrors and thinks about these two concepts as the, the structures and, and systems of the past that we want to carry forward, functional things that worked for us, but we don't want to fall prey to, to, to throwing them away and just proceeding in, a, in a, a, an undirected and unsupervised direction. Although it, it can work, she acknowledges every once in a while those flowers do bloom. But with that stewardship, with that guidance, with that experience, she thinks that your chances of success grow. At the same time, she cautions. She says, don't think as we look back for what is good, for what is important that it was a cold time, that the, that, that the way that those manners functioned was somehow not human or was, was overly um, uh, impersonal, but that really the, 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 the ways that our charm becomes fully inhabited, the way that we are seen as a bright, and light, and vigorous person come from innate qualities, not from the, the aping of certain gestures or expressions. Now, this is asking a lot. This is asking a lot of us as people. It's asking a lot of us as parents as we teach very durable etiquettes and um, and dining manners in particular to children. Now, why do table manners matter? Why are they so durable? Well, it's maybe the most important social ritual that we participate in. Now, if you are interested in a deep dive on the importance of dining as a social ritual, there is a book that I cannot recommend highly enough. Margaret Visser's The Rituals of Dinner is both a deep dive in terms of its philosophical exploration of the importance of dining and the ways that it functions socially, but it is also just chock full of some of the best examples. And for those etiquette aficionados out there, for those, um, those uh, dining etiquette enthusiasts for whom the children's content in this video is going to seem very basic, very remedial, and intentionally deep dive the detail. Her is there for you, and she's absolutely remarkable. Please don't miss for real fans, Margaret Visser's The Rituals of Dinner. Now, table manners also give us confidence. Knowing how to navigate and participate in such an important social ritual is fundamentally important. And as my uncle Peter loves to say, eating is an inherently gross activity. There are some combinations of liquids and solids that we need to get transferred from a plate, a cup, or a bowl in front of us into our mouth, masticated, chewed, and swallowed. And we need to do all that while we're maintaining the polite company of others, maybe even engaging in conversation. Now, one of my favorite Emily Post quotes and one of my favorite Emily Post pictures, I don't care what fork you use, she said after a particularly long day of answering a lot of correspondence about which fork do I use and how do I set the table, she was really much more interested in the relationships that went on at the table and how they were sustained and maintained. Now, the, the, the ending of this quote that isn't on the slide is that what matters is that they use a fork because Emily also said to let anyone see what you have in your mouth is repulsive. To make a noise is to suggest an animal. To make a mess is disgusting. And I can affirm for you that in the dining etiquette chapter of the children's book, there is a an etiquette kindergarten 
there are some early baby level instructions on how to hold utensils and how to navigate the place setting. In fact, that information in the original book etiquette, the, the big book of etiquette, was all included in an appendix called Etiquette Ch Kindergarten. Once you get to grown children who um, Emily has a reasonable expectation that they're at a stage of social and physical development where they can hold their utensils, they can sit at the table, her prime directive, her absolutely most important advice, so important that she puts it in all capitals as a one, two, three bullet list, which she never does in her writing, is to not talk with your mouth full, to chew with your mouth closed, and even to try to chew quietly, that if you can hear what's going on in someone's mouth as well as see it, that that is, that is also off-putting and off-putting in a way that is um, really important. Now, I like to linger here for just a minute because it starts to speak to something that I think is critically important and that those fans of the Victorian era will understand, which is that the aesthetics of the table matter a great deal. And they matter more than just in terms of the picture that they paint, but they matter in terms of the story that they tell. When we set a table and all of the places at the table are set in the same way, we are communicating things about the equality of the people that are dining, that we are coming together and meeting as equals on a fair playing field where everybody is treated the same. There are no kings and queens. No one is sitting on a, a special chair or throne up higher than everyone else. No one is, is, is served food that is better or, 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 or prepared differently than the other people at the table. Now we're going to take today's food and dietary restrictions. Those that actually have a topic for contemporary or current etiquette. But one of the reasons it's such a big topic is that it challenges some of the core aesthetics of the table, which is that everyone is treated the same. And that's communicated just by how the places are set and the places that people sit and how they sit at the table. Now, there are also very practical reasons for having standards that maintain that order. One, that it maintains that order, it shows respect for it. But also, if you think about hygiene, and cleanliness, and, and core table manners like washing your hands before you come to the table, well, we've just gone through a social distancing pandemic where hand sanitizing and washing up, particularly before you come and eat and feed yourself, has been re-emphasized, but it is always true that observing those traditional etiquettes of staying clean, staying neat, using utensils to eat your food, not your fingers if they're provided, um, and, and staying clean at the table functions. It functions both to maintain the order, but it also functions uh, hygienically as people share food together in this very important social ritual where we come together to share food. There are also certain risks associated and how we avoid those risks, acknowledge them, and minimize them for the benefit of each other. It's a very important part of our table manners. It's going to help us navigate a lot of really difficult situations where there isn't a particular manner that applies. You have a used sugar packet after sugaring your coffee at the end of the meal. Does it go on the saucer? Oh, I didn't get a cup of sauce. I didn't get a, a saucer with this cup of coffee. Okay, does it go on your bread plate? Oh, the bread plate was cleared. Oh. Does it go on your entree plate? Oh no, your entree plate was clear. Oh, is there still a charger? Could you tuck it under the edge of the charger out of sight? I'm going through a list of things that you could do one after another that might or might not be options that would keep the table neat and clean. The one thing I do know, even if I don't know which of those types of options is gonna be best based on your circumstance or situation, that crumpling that thing up and tossing it on the floor or onto the place of the person next to you are bad answers. There are definitely wrong answers to that situation and figuring out which ones are wrong and which ones are right in terms of the options in front of you. Thinking about basic aesthetics, thinking about core manners like chew with your mouth closed, keep your hands clean, and how those might apply to decision-making in other areas is a big part of developing an approach to table manners that is really effective because there are going to be things, there are always the it depends situations that emerge and figuring out how to navigate them and navigate them well is key to having really excellent table manners. Another thing that's really important is knowing the role that you play at the table. You could be sitting in the same chair, eating the same meal and have very different expectations of yourself depending on whether you're the host or the guest. So how do you know you're the host? Well, the meal's happening in your house, you cooked it, you bought the groceries or you sent the invitations. If you're dining out, the host should also know that they're gonna be expecting to pick up the bill. So you wanna invite clearly, you wanna let people know everything they need to participate and participate well. You then wanna plan ahead.
facts and comp when the event or uh, occasion arrives, ultimately your mood will set. People will forget whether the roast beef was well prepared or overdone. They will remember the warmth and generosity of your company. Make guests feel welcome. As a host, you can have a little checklist running in your head. You want to greet people when they arrive. You want to introduce people who don't know each other to each other. You want to check in periodically about how people are doing or whether there's anything that you can do as a host to make the experience better. So same chair, same uh, meal. But as a host, you might say to yourself, you know, I'm really going to make an effort to scan around and, and, and touch base with everybody at the table before I get too deep into conversation with the person just sitting next to me. Be flexible and gracious. Accidents will happen. Mistakes will be made. How you handle them says more about you probably than how you handle your successes. Finally, be appreciative. Thank guests for coming and for any gifts that they've brought. There are reciprocal expectations for a guest. You want to RSVP immediately. You want to let people know if you're attending and if there's any other communication that's an important part of the host guest dance, it's best to approach it as part of the RSVP. Be on time. Once you've agreed to come, show up on time. There is no fashionably late that's more than five, maybe 10 minutes late. And you definitely don't want to come too early. In some ways, being five or 10 minutes early is a bigger problem than being five or 10 minutes late because it puts a burden or pressure on your host. Be a willing participant. It's not enough just to show up. You have to engage people. You have to uh, be an active participant in the meal and the conversation around it. Offer to help when you can. It won't always be accepted. In fact, it often won't be. But now you've done a great job of participating and um and, and and offering to help if there is something that you can do don't overindulge whether it's children and mozzarella sticks or adults and champagne the host role is to be a generous host and as a guest one of your courtesies is not taking advantage of your host generosity take what's offered but try not to ask for too much more or try not to take more than your share and finally thank the host twice once for uh, once on your way out the door and then with a follow-up, particularly if someone's cooked a meal for you in their home or paid for a meal for you at a restaurant as part of a follow-up. And obviously a handwritten thank you note would be the, um, the, 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 the most formal and would allow the medium to become part of the message and really communicate that thanks in an appropriate way. So now let's get into the nitty gritty of things. We've talked a lot about some really big picture stuff. Emily Pose, Victorian childhood, the dawn of modernity. Within a culinary tradition or within a certain type of cuisine, table manners change very slowly. So let's start by just thinking about the table setting. And again, this table setting is very similar to the one that was published in the 1922 edition of Etiquette. You're going to find your table setting when you find your place at the table. Now, as a host, you're going to direct your guest of, or guest of honor to the best seat in the room, and you're going to take a seat that places them to your right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why this is useful when we talk about the direction that we pass food when we get to the bread course. If you were talking about a business lunch, this would be a very sort of traditional and common orientation for seating charts for social dining and entertaining. I recommend emilypost.com. We have a number of examples there that will help you um, figure out seating hosts and guests around round tables or long tables when you're entertaining socially. So the table setting itself is actually a bit of a roadmap. And it's a roadmap for the meal that you're likely to encounter. There are utensils that are provided that are really designed to facilitate your eating. So the utensils that you're given are going to give you some clue about the eating experience that's likely to follow. Now, I had trouble with my rights and my lefts growing up, and I did not really effectively learn how to set a table until I joined the Emily Post Institute full-time in 2008 and started teaching these programs. And I learned one of the tricks that we teach children for learning how to set a table, which is that if you can spell the word forks, you can remember how to set the table. F is for forks, those come first, they go on the left. O is for the plate, directly in the center in front of you. To the right, that's the lowercase r, come the knives and spoons in that order. So F for forks, O for the plate, right, come the knives and spoons in that order. If you can remember to point the blade of the knife in toward yourself or your own place setting, that's the less aggressive, more uh, moderate, modest approach to setting the, the table and is, is viewed as correct. If you remember to keep the blade of that knife pointed towards yourself, both when you set the table and when you set the knife down in resting position, you're going to be in great shape. Uh, rule of inches for spacing, you want things in parallel lines and you want them symmetrically spaced. The rule of inches says to leave about 
an inch of breathing room between the edge of the plate and the silver, between the silver and the bottom of the table for five-star dining or dining at West Point. There are specific measurements for these distances, but in reality, for most social entertaining, for most restaurant um, tables, they'll be set based on the, the spacing of the table, whether the edge of the table is rounded or flat. But what you're looking for is a sense of order and harmony and uh, uniformity in terms of the way the places are set next to each other and the way the elements of the place setting are, are organized in relation to each other. So now you know where the plates are gonna go, where the utensils are gonna go. The napkin might be um, on the plate in front of you. It also might be off to the left, to the left of the forks as well. Now, what about your bread plate and your drink or water glass? Well, if you can remember what lowercase b's and d's look like, you can remember that if you hold your hands up together, and I'm, by the way, contractually obligated as an etiquette instructor to do this every time I teach dining etiquette, put your index and your thumb together in a circle. Take your other three fingers, point them straight up in the air. Now, on the inverted results of a recorded webinar, they're not going to be exactly correct. But if you look at your own hands, you're going to see that there is a lowercase b in your left and a lowercase d in your right. And whether you do them up in front of you or down your lap at the next table that you find yourself at at a wedding, you will know that that is your bread plate there, even though all the place settings are matched together. And that is your drink or water glass on the right hand side. Now, dessert silver might be found at the top of the plate with the handles pointing towards the side of the plate that that utensil will resolve to when the dessert course happens, or dessert silver might be brought out at the end of the meal. BMW is an old British chick for, trick for remembering bread, meal, water. I really like B&D because it goes with me everywhere, but um, a little nod to the Brits and to De Brett's, our sister organization over there in England, on the BMW mnemonic for remembering bread, meal, water as well. So the table setting at the start of the meal I mentioned is going to be a roadmap, and this roadmap is telling me that I can anticipate about a four course meal. And the way we're going to use utensils throughout the course of the meal, we're going to work from the outside of the place setting towards the center. So in this particular case, we're going to get a soup course first. We're going to use the soup spoon to eat the soup course. So that's starting from the outside of the place setting. Course is served. Use the spoon. When that soup is clear, the spoon will be cleared with it, leaving a salad fork and knife on the outside of the place setting. When the salad course is served, we're going to use the salad fork and knife. Those will be cleared with that course, leaving an entree fork and knife. After the entree is served or the main course is served, that will be cleared along with those utensils. And the dessert silver can be slid into place to be used for the dessert course. Four course meal, four sets of utensils should work very nicely for eating the food that you're served. What if you're talking about a more formal meal? What if you're talking about a meal with a more elaborate place setting or many, many, many more courses? Well, do not worry. The same rules apply. You're still going to work your way from the outside of the place setting towards the center through successive courses. Now, Emily Post was responsible for something that um, we call the rule of three. And the idea behind the rule of three was that you would never set more than three of any kind of thing on the table at a time. Uh, the etiquetteer talk that preceded this on the YouTube channel that I can't recommend highly enough talked about the rule of three as it applied to dessert liqueurs that were served after the meal, that you would only ever present three at a time, that doing any more than that would just be excessive and, and, and unreasonable. Well, the rule of three also applied to the utensils that were set on the table. So even if there were seven courses that required forks, you would only set three uh, courses worth of forks on the table at a time. If a fork was required for a course that it wasn't set for, it would be brought out with that course. Now, this is a chance for me to mention one of the differences between American and European style uh, restaurant service. And American service, we expect that the utensils are going to be on the table at the start of the meal. In European style or continental style service, the utensil for the appropriate course is brought out with that course. So if you do find a table with more courses than you have utensils, really don't worry. There's nothing designed about the way a meal is served to trick or confuse you. The utensil that's appropriate for the course will either be brought out or presented to you when the time is right. Now, you might encounter a utensil that you're not as familiar with. Maybe a fork that doesn't look quite like a fork that's on the wrong side of the plate. Don't worry. It just means something good, exciting is going to happen. Probably an oyster in this particular case, where I see an oyster fork on the outside of this place setting. It's also worth mentioning that 
as the the number of courses grows as the possibility for pairing wines with courses grows as we up our formality there might be more and more glasses on the table there are different arrangements in terms of shape for those glasses but you want to follow the same basic protocol that you do with the utensils of using the outside for the glasses that will be used first so a champagne flute for a toast that would precede the meal would go on the outside if there were white wines that paired with early courses or red wines that paired with early courses, the appropriate wine glass for the course would be set next. If you're going to change wines over the course of a meal from one red to another, another glass might be brought out or might be placed on the table ahead of time. You would work your way through those glasses in the same sequential way that you work your way through the utensils that are set on the table. In this particular meal, it looks like we're going to have a soup course that will follow uh, an oyster. And then a fish course. Now, the fish knife and fish fork look a little different than the usual fish, than the usual fork or the usual knife. Sometimes that fish knife will have a little hook on the top designed for deboning at the table. This is where I also get to mention that the more formal the experience, the more likely you are to encounter something that's prepared in a slightly different or creative way, or maybe be served a part or of an animal or a, a type of food that you're not used to eating. And if you do get served an artichoke and you're not exactly sure if it's finger food or how to use the knife to cut out the heart, the advice is always to ask your host and follow their lead. If the host isn't available, if they're at the end of a very long table, you want to work with the people around you to do the best that you can in a similar spirit or fashion. The idea is that no one is trying to um, test you or confuse you at the table. I think of any meal where I get to try a new food for the first time as a complete success. I find it exciting if I encounter something that I don't know how to do at the table. I want to communicate that sense of enthusiasm as an approach to take if you find yourself in a similar situation or experience. You can say to yourself, oh, this is excellent. I get to try something new. The older I get in life, the fewer those opportunities are and the more and more appreciate them. So never deboned a fish at the table. Talk to the server. Talk to the person managing your table. Sometimes there's a table manager when the, the service is very formal. There will sometimes be two uh, people assigned to any particular diner, someone who's serving while someone is simultaneously clearing. In those kinds of coordinated, almost choreographed service situations, there's oftentimes a table manager, someone who's coordinating that service, who's there and they're ex was the purpose besides coordinating the service to answer questions that you have to engage with diners about the food, the choices the chef's making, and ways to eat and enjoy the food that is presented. In this particular meal, you don't need to count tines on the fork. You just keep working your way from the outside in and you'll find an entree fork for an entree before the meal is concluded with a salad. When the salad fork and knife set on the inside where you will use them last. Let's talk about using those utensils just a little bit, because this is one of those places where judgments are formed almost instantaneously in people's minds when we see how people use their utensils. Our first utensil is your napkin. It's like home base. It's a safe place. You want to get it into your lap as soon as possible and use it to cover as much of your clothing as possible. It's there to clean your fingers and face as needed, but also to protect the clothing that you wear. So. If it's a paper napkin, you can just lay it on your thigh. If it's a linen napkin, you're gonna unfold it halfway. You're gonna leave it folded in half. And whether that half is a diagonal uh, fold that leaves you with a triangle shape or a rectangular, a square fold that leaves you with a rectangular shape. I like the triangle because it's got a lot of coverage area. Place the fold against your belt or waist and then let the napkin drape open over the fronts of your legs. A little point of refinement, you can clean your fingers on your napkin on the inside that way. If you fold back the top of the napkin, you can wipe your hands or fingers or face as needed on the inside of the napkin. That leaves the outside of the fold. So if you fold on the inside, it leaves the outside looking clean and neat. It both looks clean and neat and also protect your clothes. It'll give you a surface of that napkin that you can return to your lap and be confident that you're not going to put that food onto your, onto your own clothing. Whether you are leaving the table at the end of the meal or whether you've excused yourself to use the restroom and are going to be returning to the table, you're always going to place your napkin loosely refolded. You don't need to fold it all the way back up. Just loosely gather it up and lay it to the left-hand side of your place setting. Some etiquette experts will you place on the back of your chair as a signal that you plan to return to the table as opposed to on the table saying that you're going to leave. This is not correct. You do not want to take a napkin that potentially has food on it and put it on a chair that might have upholstery that's not designed to be laundered or 
just as bad, put the food on the chair and then have the food transfer onto your clothing. That napkin is really designed to, to help you clean up messes, clean up yourself. And it's also designed to be laundered in the same way that the table linens are designed to be laundered. So you wanna keep those messes on the table and off the chair and off the clothing that you're wearing. How do we hold those utensils? Well, we're gonna start with the knife because the knife, as I mentioned, has a sharp edge. You wanna have the maximum control over it and you wanna use it as little as possible. The less you wielded your knife at the table, the more refined your manners. This is one of those um, sort of artifices that we've retained as our table knives have become less and less dangerous over time. You place the butt or the handle in the palm of your hand. You're gonna wrap your three fingers around the bottom of the handle or the base Place your forefinger on the back or the neck of the knife and then wrap your thumb around to complete and secure the grip. For the vast majority of people, you're gonna use your knife in your right hand. It's our dominant hand. It's the hand that's gonna give us the most control of it. For true lefties, if you really truly do, sign your name with your left hand, write with your left hand, it's perfectly okay to use your knife in your left hand. For most people, you're gonna be using your fork in your left hand while you hold your knife in your right. And the grip is almost identical. You place the butt or the handle in the palm of your hand, close your fingers around it, bring your index or pointer finger to the back of the handle and bring your thumb around to complete and secure the grip. That does leave the tines pointing down while you're holding the fork in this manner in your left hand. And the picture that it paints should look something like this. If you're new to holding a fork with your tines down like this, might find your elbows coming up, you get a little nervous, just relax, take a deep breath, let them fall back down to your sides. This is not an affectation. This is not putting on airs. This is not like a pinky flag while you sip your tea. It really is the way that forks are designed to be used. There's as much flat area on that side of a fork as there is on that side of the fork. If you're using so much of the fork that you need it like a shovel, I suggest taking slightly smaller bites. Now, in the continental style of dining, the fork stays in the left hand to bring the bite to your mouth. In the American or zigzag style of dining, the knife is set down after the bite's been cut and the fork is passed from the left hand to the right and the grip changes. So when the fork moves from the left hand, when you've got a knife in your right, to the right hand and it's being used solo, the grip changes to the same grip you would use if you were writing with a pencil. Now you keep the grip effectively the same and turn your wrist over. You've now got a grip that gives you the same dexterity that you need to cross T's and dot I's, but you've got it in your right hand so that you can pick up P's and that last little bit of mashed potato. Now, your fork and your spoon, when they're used by themselves, when they're used solely and they're used in the right hand or the left hand, if you're left hand dominant, the grip is going to look this. If you're using your knife in one hand and your fork in the other, the grip is going to change to that grip that we just reviewed and the tines of the fork are going to point down. As I mentioned, in the continental style of dining, the fork stays in your left hand as you transition the bite to your mouth. So you cut with your knife in your right and your fork in your left. The fork stays in the left, the knife is set down, and the bite comes to your mouth. When you're dining in the American style, you cut with the knife in the right, fork in the left, the exact same way as you do in the continental style. But after the bite is cut, the knife is placed down on the plate, the fork transitions hands, the grip changes to bring the bite to your mouth. Which way is correct? Either are fine. You can eat either the American or continental style of dining. You can change during courses. Most people in America eat the American style and use a little bit of the continental style without even really thinking about it. I like to emphasize the continental style because in some ways it makes eating so much easier and it's a nice tool to have in your toolbox to have at your disposal. It really isn't that 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 putting on airs, snobby eating. The tines of the fork down is really the way that fork is designed to be used. If you think about the placement of your finger on the back or neck of that fork, it really holds something in place and gives you a lot of control over it while you're cutting. It also leaves the knife in your right hand to use as a pusher to build perfect bites. When you set the knife down, transition the fork to the other hand, you've now given up that pusher, you've given up that other um, implement, that other hand, and you're, you're just left to eat as best you can with your fork in your right hand. But if you develop some skill with that continental styling, it's easier to, um, I think, build that bite and eat that way. Definitely worth a practice, worth thinking about how you employ the continental and how you employ the American style of dining, depending on what's served. So what is not a utensil? Well, 
it's a trick question. Everyone's thinking fingers, but I really want to remind you that there is no place in the place setting for a phone. That is not something that we reviewed and covered. If you need to use your phone at the table, by all means, alert people ahead of time that you might be called elsewhere and step away from a table where other people are sharing a meal to take your attention to somebody who's on a phone. Let's talk about courses and let's talk about some manners that are specific to courses. Let's start with hors d'oeuvres. Get a napkin and a spare. Always have an extra napkin. That's one of my best etiquette tips. Um, you can tuck it right under that little plate that you're gonna use as you're circulating and serving yourself. Uh, put food and dressing on your plate because the biggest mistake that people make with hors d'oeuvres and food that is set out before the meal begins is the double dip. Once something has been in your mouth or even in, in uh, on your plate where other food that has maybe been in your mouth and been returned to the plate has been, it doesn't go back into a shared condiment or service bowl of any kind. So you want to be really careful about that particular observance of hygiene. This is one of those things that other people will definitely notice. They will pull things off serving tables, bring them to hosts, and tell them about people double dipping. Leave some for others. Again, remember that guest role that you want to not take advantage of a host generosity. The hors d'oeuvre course or the, the food that precedes the meal isn't designed to fill you up. It's just designed to tide you over. Could I get you something? This is a great time to play that host guest dance to offer to help either with transitioning people to a dining room or with cleanup or just with circulating as people are arriving and getting ready for a meal. And finally, keep it neat. Don't leave a trail of detritus behind you as you move about a room, as you circulate and enjoy hors d'oeuvres. Let's talk about the bread course. After you've ordered from a menu or early on in a meal where there is no ordering from a menu happening, oftentimes bread will be placed on the table. When do you start eating bread? As soon as it's presented. If there is a basket of bread, if it's not given to each person at the table individually, and this is one of those great classic uh, Victorian era manners that people today can't believe. Bread used to just be placed on the table or wrapped up in a napkin. It didn't have its own plates. It didn't have its own baskets. It was just given to you as a diner. And this was a Victorian era holdover from even earlier eras where that bread was oftentimes also part utensil or part serving dish. Is it all right to ask someone to pass that bread? Absolutely. Which way is bread passed? Well, this is where we get to talk about passing food. In general, we're gonna pass food to the right. Now, if someone who's immediately to your left asks for a piece of bread, you can absolutely hand it to them. But if you're talking about a big table and direction for passing, we're gonna pass right. And if you think about the idea that formal service was presented from the left and cleared from the right, there was a reason for that. The idea was that right-hand dominant people could serve themselves from a tray or platter easily if food was presented from the left. Now, if you are playing the role of passing food at the table, as you pass to the right, you're essentially presenting to the person to your right's left. You become that server who's presenting food from the left. You can either hold it for them while they serve themselves and then they pass it on, or you can set it on the table and where it is to their left, they can serve themselves, then pass it to their right, where it's now being presented to that person from their left. It maintains some consistency and some order around the table, and it also has a logic based on the easiest way for most people to serve themselves. What's the proper way to butter bread? Well, we got a little video to talk about that. You're gonna do it one bite at a time. And where should you put the bread knife down while you're still using it? Your bread plate is a great option. And again, if we can remember to keep that blade pan pointed towards ourselves, we'll be doing great. How do you eat bread and butter? Well, I mentioned one bite at a time. The idea here is that you don't wanna be tearing hunks off the roll with your teeth. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna butter, you're gonna tear off an individual piece of, of bread. For some reason, the you're gonna tear off a bite-sized piece. You're gonna butter it from a pat of butter that's been placed on your butter plate. And then you're gonna pop that bite into your mouth and repeat this process as needed. Now, I'm gonna call out my lovely assistant who recorded this video. There's a point of refinement. If you actually butter not in the air in front of you, but with that piece of bread held against the edge of the plate, you'll be in absolutely perfect shape. Break then butter, break then butter. Soup course. What is the proper way to eat soup? With a spoon. How do you use a spoon the right way? Well, you eat off the side of a spoon. Spoons were developed from ladles. If you think you pour off the side of a ladle, not off the tip. So you don't fly a spoon into your mouth with the 
handle perpendicular to your face. It's at a little bit of an angle. You want to open your mouth, soup and spoon go in, close your mouth, your lips, spoon comes out, soup stays in. Is it okay to tip a soup bowl? Absolutely. You tip it away from yourself. Where do you put a soup spoon down while you're still eating? Well, if it's a wide, shallow bowl, it can sit in the bowl. But if it's in a, a cup or a, a, a higher dish with a saucer, you want to lay it down on the saucer so you're less likely to knock it. What if your tie is falling in your soup? Well, this is where I get to talk about posture at the table just a little bit. If you're leaning so far over your soup that your tie would be dangling into it, that is gonna be a reminder to sit up straight at the table. Now, there was a Victorian era standard that when you were at a meal dining with others, your back didn't touch the back of the chair that you were sitting in. The idea was that you sat on a chair, not in a chair. I really recommend trying it. I don't want everyone to walk around rigid, stiff as a board, feeling uncomfortable and out of place, but take a little notice of the difference between the way that you engage with the people around you. If your back is in the chair versus if you're sitting up straight with head on top of shoulders, shoulders on top of hips. It brings your attention to the table. It makes you available and open to engage in that polite conversation with the other people that you're dining with. It's a really important way that you can check yourself and stay engaged at the table at all times. Now, realistically today, it's not an expectation that everyone has of themselves or others. And if your back touches the back of the chair, it's probably not that big a deal, but it's a, a very, um, to me, interesting traditional manner that can give us some real cues about ways to engage ourselves and ways to bring ourselves fully to the table and that experience of sharing food with others. The clothing that we wear is oftentimes an indicator of the types of expectations that we have of ourselves and others. And as your levels of formality go up, both in terms of food presentation, but also in terms of attire that you find yourself wearing to the table, those are clues that you want to start to stick more um, firmly to the structures and expectations for table managers. One of the examples I give is that a suit is designed or a jacket is often designed so that you don't bring your elbows above your shoulders. You want to keep your motions relatively calm and restrained. You want to occupy the space that you're operating in. There's an old expression that nothing good can happen at the table with your hands above your shoulders other than bringing food to your mouth. And this is a reminder to keep hands out of hairs, ears, eyes, nose, mouth, obviously, if you can help it, that you want to use those utensils. But it can be so reassuring, so comforting, such a a familiar gesture to tuck hair behind the ear that we can find ourselves doing it unconsciously and just taking a moment to, to, to formalize our thinking about posture and how we hold our bodies and conduct ourselves at the table, I think is a really important part of table manners and goes as far towards creating the impression that we want to create as almost anything else that we can do at the table besides holding utensils correctly. So how do we eat soup? I want to get into that tipping of the soup bowl and the dipping of the soup spoon and using the spoon correctly. So I kind of left a little bit for the video. Now, the little mnemonic, the little rhyme that people remember is to dip away, drip away, tip away. So you don't want to be shoveling the soup towards yourself, particularly because definitionally, when you put that soup spoon down into the soup, there might be some soup clinging to the bottom of it that's likely to drip. And it is okay to clear that drip on the side of the soup bowl, but we wanna do it on the side of the bowl that's away from you. So you dip away, you scoop away, clear the drip away on the far side. And if you were to need to tip the soup bowl to get that last delicious morsel of soup, you wanna tip it gently away from yourself as well. So that's dip away, drip away, tip away. Now, I had been teaching these dining etiquette talks for a couple of years, starting in 2008. And when I started teaching, I changed my own habits. I had never thought about which way I dipped my soup spoon. I was giving this advice. I started doing very consistently the dip away. I was amazed at how quickly it became an ingrained habit and something that I don't even need to think about these many, many years later. But that process actually happened very quickly for me. So soup course, we've got a bunch of very important manners, actually. We we're thinking about posture at the table. We're thinking about the, the option of leaning forward a little bit to close that gap between um, ourselves and the edge of the table, but not leaning so far forward that we start to hover over our food. It gives me one other chance to talk about a point of refinement. The idea at the table is that you can use those utensils to bring the food from your plate to your mouth successfully, that you don't need to take your mouth to the food 
in order to eat it. So you're not gonna hunch over your food. And this is where we get to talk about elbows on the table a little bit. The only mention of elbows on the table that Emily has in her early editions is that you don't rest your elbows on the table or wrap an arm around the food that you're eating while you shovel it into your mouth. She actually thought it was a lovely and charming posture for someone on the table and lean forward in conversation when they didn't have utensils in their hands. She thought it created a charming portrait of a woman to rest her form on the table and lean forward. The French have a great expression. They say, toujours quelque fois jamais, always, sometimes, never. And it gets applied in different circumstances in different ways. But at the table, the French expression is meant to indicate that you always have your hands in sight. Sometimes rest your forearms on the table, never your elbows. So the idea is that you always keep your hands in sight, European continental style dining, don't recover your hands to your lap. That is completely acceptable in American style dining, but be aware it's a difference between American continental style dining and probably would have been an expectation of Victorian era um, more than it is today that you generally as a sign of courtesy kept your hands in sight and resting on the edge of the table. Sometimes that could be the forearm but never propping yourself up and definitely never resting with a utensil in your hand. In fact, that's the turn of phrase. Emily's early book, she describes this long table of aristocrats with their elbows perched on the table, gesturing with their silver. And it looks like um, clothing flapping on a clothesline uh, hung out in the breeze. Just a remarkable image. The salad course is going to come next in this particular meal. How do you eat those pesky cherry tomatoes? Well, you now know how to use your knife and fork as a pusher so you can hold that tomato in place while you spear it. You also want to remember to close your mouth so it doesn't shoot out. I used to think this was silly advice till I was sitting at an etiquette dinner. I bit a cherry tomato and it squirted out onto the table and I said, I'm never going to skip this tip ever again. What do you do with the olive pit or anything else you want to remove from your mouth? Well, this is one where there's a Victorian era rule that said it goes out the way it went in, which meant that if you ate it with a knife and fork, you put that piece of gristle right back on the edge of the fork and brought it down to the edge of your plate. If it was an olive pit or finger food, something that you ate with your fingers, then you could take it back out with your fingers and place it down on the edge of your plate. Now, there was a, a lot of discussion between the fourth and fifth generation of the Emily Post family about whether or not we should go with the traditional rule that goes out the way it came in or whether um, uh, or whether we should acknowledge the trend that it developed of people shielding with their hand and taking something out and putting it on the edge of the plate with their fingers. Well, I went back to the original source and Emily had already offered that dispensation in 1922. She said, well, there's the way it went out is the way the way it goes out is the way it went in rule but i think that's just silly i think it's perfectly reasonable for you to shield with your hand or a napkin and take that bite out and place it back down on the edge of your plate so this was one of those victorian victorian era rules that we don't need to question today because it was already questioned almost 100 years ago but i like to know about i like to offer it up and it is a table manner that some people remember and i think it's definitely worth knowing about if you have two forks and only one knife, what you do with the knife when you're finished with the salad? Well, you can always place it on your bread plate. That's a great place to take anything that has gotten messy in. You don't want to return to the table. Um, and it's also always okay to ask for a fresh knife. If you've used a knife for one course and there's a new course coming that is not being demanding or um, uh, um, asking too much of a server, particularly in a restaurant situation, to have a clean knife or a clean course. If the salad has large leaves, do you cut it all up or one piece at a time? The salad course, it's okay to cut the whole course up with a couple big cross hatches. That's those wedge salads or those new, very popular whole leaf romaine um, Caesars. You go ahead and break that lettuce all up right at the start. You used to not cut lettuce. There was concern about the silver and silverware being tarnished by the vinegar and salad dressings. We don't have those concerns so much today. It's perfectly acceptable to use a knife with a salad course, even if there is dressing. If you drop a fork, you want to resist all of your best and better urges and not find yourself on the floor um, bringing it out uh, or, or helping someone out by bringing it back to the table. Once something has been down on the floor, you want to leave it there till the meal is over or till someone who um, isn't dining at the table is able to clear it and move it away. Uh, 
it's not easy. You want to resist those helping angels that are that are the better part of our nature. And particularly as a guest, when you're wanting to help your host, or even as a host, maybe wanting to clear it or get it removed as quickly as possible. In general, we're going to observe the, the dictates of hygiene and not do anything that has us either bringing items or our hands down from the floor back up to the table while the meal is, is underway. For the main course, you want to be really careful. You don't want to season your food until you taste it, particularly if the cook is at the table with you. You always want to taste first before you season. For the main course, you just want to eat one piece of um one bite at a time. You want to cut one piece of meat and then eat it. Maybe you could prepare a bite or two ahead, but there's something a little childish about preparing the whole plate of food at the very start of the course and then just eating with the fork. Also, the meat that is served is often designed to continue to cook while you're eating it to stay hot and to stay moist and delicious and to be at the perfect level of doneness as you work your way from the outside of that steak towards the center over the course of eating the meal, over the course of the course. So eating one bite at a time, cutting as you go is an important um, sophistication as, as, as we all up our dining etiquette. When is it acceptable to use your fingers? When it's obviously acceptable to use your fingers. When the gloves and the wet wipes have been poured out on the table with the soft shell crabs, when your host has offered you a dispensation, but absent that, you're gonna use the knife and fork or the utensils that were presented for any course. It is okay to sop up sauce with bread. We're just gonna suggest that you approach it the same way that you approach buttering that bread. You're gonna tear off a bite-sized piece and use your fork to mix it around on the plate and pop it in your mouth. If the food is not prepared correctly, you want to get your first attention in a restaurant to it. The idea is not to make a big scene out of it, not to embarrass your host, the restaurant, or the establishment, but to get food. It's possible to correct it, correct it. If there is a safety concern, if there is an issue about uncooked, meat or even foreign object in the food. That's the place where safety trumps etiquette. And we, we, we do like to emphasize that, that safety is the playing field that we play on. The rules of etiquette are to work within that safe playing field. And if there's something in the meal that represents danger to people, you want to um, you want to speak, speak up quickly. You don't want to uh, overproduce the reaction, but you definitely want to use an appropriate reaction. Let's talk a little bit about dessert. You've done all the hard work. We've made it through hors d'oeuvres and all of our courses. And now we get to enjoy and relax as the meal winds down. If you have pie a la mode, use a fork or a spoon to eat it. Well, you really have your choice and different desserts are going to dictate different things. The reminder here is that you generally are just using a fork or a spoon in your right hand. You use one at a time. You can transition back and forth between them as you'd like. Is it all right to offer someone a bite of your dessert? Well, on a first date, if it's going well, maybe. On a business lunch or dinner, more formal situations, probably not. If you're interested in sharing desserts, you can always ask for extra plates and you can section out a dessert to share among several people in a way that doesn't have to be both. All of you to share. What do you do with your tea bag or anything else that you don't know how to discard? Of? Well, we've talked some about this. You're going to observe the aesthetics of the meal that have been set up and established right from the start. And you're going to do the best you can with the situation that you have in front of you. If you don't want coffee, we're going to employ a depression era manner of flipping the cup over. And we're not going to do the same thing if we have wine glasses and we don't want wine. You can just politely decline. If you want, you can ask the server to remove the cup or they might do it on their own once you've said that you're not interested. When it's time to leave, your napkin goes loosely to the left. That's our little mnemonic, LL. Let's talk a little bit more about that etiquette at the end of the meal. We'll start with placement of utensils. When you're resting, while eating American style, and you place your fork and knife down on the plate, it's gonna look something like this. They're the natural positions that the utensils fall into from where you've been holding them. During continental style, it's probably gonna look something a little more like this. When you are finished, you're gonna bring the handles of those knives and forks wherever they are on the plate together, and you're gonna put them down in the lower right-hand quadrant of the plate. So if the plate were the face of a clock, you could think of those handles as pointing somewhere around the four or the five o'clock position. 
this is a cue both to your server and to your um, host that you're finished eating, that you're not about to pick your food up and continue on with the course. So slightly more formal situation, it might look a little different, but the basic action is the same. Some other important etiquette for the end of the meal, more for grownups than for children. As a guest, you don't want to be offering to pay when the check arrives. If you're interested in splitting the bill, the time to do that is part of the RSVP exchange. Oh, I'd love to join you for lunch, but don't think you're going to pick up the tab again like you did last week. It's my turn or I, I, I want to keep this going. Please let me split it with you. What is an acceptable amount to tip? You always want to be tipping 15 to 20 percent in America if you're operating somewhere where servers are not protected by minimum wage laws. The reality is that the vast majorities of servers in America aren't protected by the same minimum wage laws that other workers are protected by. If you live in a state that treats the minimum wage for servers differently, you have a lot more latitude in terms of how you thinking, how you think about tipping. It's still a great way to show appreciation for good service, but the the decision making isn't as firmly um, uh, established between the 15 and 20 percent that the tip is expected to be in places where servers are not protected by those minimum wage laws. If the server's tips are taxed and if they're not paid as much as the people who are working in the kitchen washing dishes, then you absolutely have to be tipping 15 to 20 percent when you eat out um, at a restaurant. In if you receive poor service, is it paid and not to the wage staff? Absolutely not. If the service is poor, you want to be addressing it in some other way rather than communicating through the tip. So if the issue that you've encountered has risen to the place where you're thinking about not tipping, the, the suggested course of action is that you ask to talk to a manager or an owner about the problem because they're really going to want to know about it. And um, they're going to be able to better address and figure out um, the, the best way to move forward. There's a good chance that they might comp the meal or um, uh, that the, they will suggest a course of action moving forward that probably is, is more effective than what you can suggest for reducing your tip amount. Ultimately, the most important thing you can do at any lunch or dinner or breakfast for that matter is be an active participant. Take part in the conversation, talk with the people around you, connect with your host or the people who are serving the meal. Remember the human experience that's at the heart of and, un and operating underneath all of these sort of more practical expectations that we have of ourselves and others. For a little review, I've left you with the top 10 takeaway table manners. A reminder to be on time, to pay attention to how you hold your knife and fork and all your utensils, to think about where you sit and the role that you play, whether you're a host or a guest. If you're talking business, that you allow the person who's hosting the meal to bring it up. If you're dining socially, that you participate and engage in conversation, that you bring something to that experience, that you participate as a conversationalist. Know your limits. Don't exceed them. Don't overeat. Don't overdrink. Wait for the host to start eating. Uh, pay attention to the cues that let your host or server know when you've finished a course. Chew with your mouth closed. Pace yourself. Try to keep up with the people around you. Try not to rush the people around you. Try not to be the last person to finish every time and have everyone waiting for you before the next course. Remember to thank them twice, both for attending and for gifts or for having you and with a follow-up the next day. I think human attention is a gift and I really appreciate the gift of attention that you've given me today. I thank you so much for the time that we've spent together and wish you great success in all of your future endeavors, both eating and teaching children dining etiquette.